Okay, uh, good afternoon. I'm very happy to be here and to open uh, this, uh, this session. Hopefully you had a good lunch in spite of the sunny, sunny day. Uh, and um, uh, we have a two, two hour and a half discussion on one of the most urgent issues of our time. I think if one has to choose the top three challenges, global challenges in the world now, the most urgent issues of our time, Arguably, two of them would be uh, terrorism and uh, international migration. Discussing, addressing each of them is, uh, I mean, a very difficult task uh, in itself. And of course, addressing the nexus between both of them, uh, terrorism and global migration, is even more challenging and even more complex. I'm not sure that we will have uh, a complete agreement in this session, but at least we will have some important questions and some initial discussion on one of the greatest challenges of our time. Our first speaker, I'm pleased to introduce, is the Honorable Rumiana Bakvarova. Uh, Rumiana Bakvarova is the former Deputy Prime Minister of Bulgaria from 2014 to 2017, and also the former Minister of the Interior, uh, where she served from 2015 to 2017. As the Minister of the Interior of Bulgaria, Ms. Bakvarova worked on the drafting of the Bulgarian Anti-Terrorism Act, which initiated some uh, law enforcement measures against uh, modern threat to security. She participated in the development of the, United, of the National Counterterrorism Center and in the implementation of new methods for identifying illegal migrants. Currently, she serves as the Chief of Staff of the Prime Minister of Bulgaria. Her presentation, uh, just to kind of uh, trigger the discussion that will uh, come soon after, will focus on the need uh, for a new approach uh, in addressing migration and terrorism and the importance of uh, international cooperation uh, in Europe and beyond, and of course the use of uh, technological measure, how technology can be used in the fight uh, against terrorism. Please, Ms. Borba. Uh, thank you for presenting me this uh, way. I, I want to say that I'm proud to be here. It is my first visit in the Institute to take part in the conference and to have a chance to present my views uh, based on my experience as a Minister of Interior in the last two years. Um, I think that we have a lot of issues uh, to discuss on this. And uh, we will uh, continue to face both these challenges, migration and terrorism, because there are a lot of links between uh, them. First, I will present and give you some information about the specificities in Bulgaria. Bulgaria is a transit country for migratory terrorists and foreign fighter routes. Uh, it is neither a target nor a place to set up terrorist cells, at least for now. The geographic proximity to Muslim states and a multilingual Muslim community offer a natural connection and environment for the penetration of global terrorism, radicalization, and political conflicts in the world. The specific is that the Bulgarian Muslim community that exposes traditional Islam resists the new Islamic ideas. This serves as a natural and strong filter against the import of radicalism. I find it very uh, important uh, detail because we may based on this to develop our next, next strategies. The bomb attack on a bus with Israeli tourists at Sarafu Airport in Bulgaria 2012 demonstrated that there is no insurance against terrorism even in a favorable national security environment. In current globally complicated situation as uh, we, as other European countries, have met migration challenge. Over the past five years, since 2011, around 80,000 people have applied asylum at our borders. Another 10,000 have been detained and not allowed to enter. 7,000 have been declined refugee status because of non-compliance with the requirements. This significant share of the border stops and status denial show how strengthened our measures we applied. 
Today, these numbers are at least eight times less, which we achieved through strict measures and a policy of dynamic reaction, with terror measures for every change in the intensity and profile of the migration waves. At the beginning of the crisis in 2011, over 90% of the migrants passing through our territory were asylum seekers from Syria. After 2015, the number of economic migrants from other nationalities grew, Afghans, Pakistans, Iraqis. Their end goal uh, was different, they so uh, was their conduct. The measures taken to manage this uh, needs more complex and firm and changes our border control practices. An almost 200 kilometer protective facility was built along the Bulgarian-Turkish border. Registrations on migrants became mandatory and comprehensive, and the weight of judicial centers for migrant smuggling was increased. However, the most significant factor in successfully managing the situation was maintaining political dialogue, first within the framework of European Union, and second with <coughs> Turkey and Greece. The active exchange of information about the risks and trespassing of migrant groups, cooperation between border police and in intelligence services among countries, set a broader network for prevention and security. This had also stabilized me. At the operational level, the exchange of advanced information of trespassing groups and their interception by military and border police in Turkey was a daily practice with great impact. I would say that without the joint efforts with Turkish border and military services, the migration processes in Bulgaria and also in Europe would have forget a very different landscape. The best example of this positive outcome from this approach is the work of the Center of Combating Smuggling and Illegal Migration, three-party center, between Bulgaria, Greece, and Turkey, uh, it was uh, at Capitan Andreevo border checkpoint, which is the biggest one in the Europe. For the historical relations between the Balkan states, the agreement for this center was a real achievement. You can imagine how complicated was the negotiations, uh, negotiations with Turkey and Greece in the same time, and finally we achieved this result, uh, take decision, and this center now is working. Second, representatives of the Customs and Police Services in Bulgaria, Greece, and Turkey work together on the border and customs-related cases, and information exchange takes places in real time, and they resolve issues on site as a team. The positive results of this approach prove that there is a point in joint political and operational efforts on regional level. Addressing a large-scale transnational phenomenon can only happen through common measures and policies. If one country in the chain were to reduce, uh, reduce their activity, this could undermine the render useless the work of all others in the chain of bordering country. When we speak of and analyze migrant flows, we should not forget that they were actively assisted and even initiated, it is very important to point, by transborder organized crime. With the billions of dollars that fell into the hands of these people, they managed to conduct the largest ever global migration of peoples over the past 15 years. According to Europol report from 2016, the revenue gained by them uh, from illicit migration was for, just for uh, 2015, almost five billion euros. This money helped feed and expand the networks of organized crime. Today, with an 80% drop in migrant traffic, these networks have been left hungry for this profit, and, uh, and now uh, they remain open for new customers, uh, and we can say that in spite of the drop of migratory pressure, the criminal and terrorist risk remain significantly high. In the situation we have been over the past few years, namely strong migratory pressure and risk of terrorism, the greatest challenge for us has been the lack of capabilities to precise personal identification of those passing through. We are currently able to determine the number of people that have migrated from crisis regions to Europe, but not 
who these individuals actually are. In order to address this problem, Bulgaria managing one of the external borders of the EU concluded and is implementing an agreement between our Ministry of Interior and United States uh, Department of Homeland Security for the automated exchange of biometric data, fingerprints. This provides the opportunity to cross-checks in the information systems of both countries to identify persons. These persons are uh, from these categories. Those who have or are planning to uh, uh, perpetrate a terrorist or terrorist-related activity, participants in terrorist groups, trained or trained perpetrators, participants in uh, serious organized crime groups or other such groupings outside the territory of our country. The mechanism was tested and is now in its, uh, in its launch phase. The results from tests shown that on average of around 10% of the overall flow uh, fall uh, within the above categories. This further proves that the migration waves are a cover for person who high terrorist or criminal risk to Europe. If the test phase results are confirmed in the next phase of implementation, we can then be sure that we are dealing with hundreds of persons linked to terrorists or criminal groups who have entered and are most probably currently residing in Europe. However, that is more important is that in the future we will have the capability to identify and stop such persons. It is great achievement for our government and the country. Curbing their access to the territory to Bulgaria, of Bulgaria and respectively Europe is only the first major benefit of this project. The results would guarantee much greater security for uh, citizens, both of the partner countries, Bulgaria and the United States, uh, I need to mention that Bulgaria is the only country in the Europe who has such an agreement, will be able to have more complete information to analyze and compare data about the conduct of the registered person from the categories previously outlined. Our expectations are that establishing connectivity among our databases and the proactive and quick exchange of information will be more effective than any physical barrier at the border like our fence. This is no doubt that the best and most reliable response the recent day trades is the integration of efforts, resources, and information from different services and of different states. It is uh, not difficult to be uh, to said, but it is difficult to be implemented uh, in practice. Um, let me say a few words also about the collateral consequences, uh, consequences from the uh, migrant flows on security in the countries along the migration routes. The link between migration and the terrorist threats gives rise to negative attitudes and xenophobia within the European societies. They became the basis for the disgruntled European citizens and for political attacks and destabilization. Test such an environment only facilitates the terrorists and creates obstacles for the successful integration of the refugees. We should not forget also that consequently this generates secondary preconditions for radicalization and extremism. Transformation of the profile and modus operandi of terrorism in Europe has been made easy by the accessibility and attractiveness of social media. Radicalization being organized in the new public domain of social media um, practic uh, practically uh, um, provide for the bl uh, breaking the geographic boundaries and time and publicity have taken on new dimension. It is not chance, uh, it is not by chance that terrorist organizations have become even more creative and innovative in the distribution of their propaganda. It is also very um, significant uh, and we need to know this. All we agreed that the terrorism today aims to our value system and globalization. The paradox is that those who stand against our contemporary world are attacking it with its most 
avant-garde technological and, com and communicational achievements. Moreover, at least up to now, they have been able to use them more adeptly and innovatively than our law enforcement agencies. That's why strategic battle is about the overtaking. The battle with modern day terrorism is not only for uh, who will have the upper hand, but also who will be the leading in this race. Um, unfortunately, the security measures being implemented after every attack have not been able to protect us from the next attack. We also need to know this and to realize this. A new and adequate response is needed in this changed security environment. My belief is that it starts with the integration of resources and activities of all state institutions on national level. Exchange of information from national information system of the neighboring countries and for example, in European countries. Uh, joint operational measures of security services, political cooperation in a broad regional and global context. All this requires common understanding and everyday hard working. Most of all, we need to build up mutual trust and cooperation on different levels between states, governments, and, secur excuse me, and security services because the war on terror cannot be won by one state. At the end, the victory will be for the whole humanity. Thank you. So, Honorable Pachvorova, uh, we are very delighted to be uh, to have you here at IDC in Israel. As my own family is from Bulgaria, I'm, uh, even it adds to my excitement, my own excitement for your presence here. And I have been doing research on migration, on global migration, uh, for the past 15 years. And I must admit that I found your presentation on the Bulgarian case fascinating and interesting. Uh, and the exchange of biometric is uh, surely a point to be to be discussed later. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Ms. Rebecca. Bratzker, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, the next, uh, yeah, so Mrs. Bratzker is a political affairs officer at the Canton Terrorism Committee of the United Nations Security Council, uh, where she's currently serving as an acting coordinator of the Political Analysis and Research Unit. Uh, Ms. Bratzker is also a Norwegian citizen, uh, and she holds a Master of Art degree from the King's College in London in security conflict and development, as well as a Bachelor of Art degree from, uh, on political science from Fordham University, uh, all the, good, the best places. Previously, uh, she worked for, the, for a number of research organizations and institutions in Norway, the US, the UK, and Sri Lanka, and her presentation will focus on uh, new challenges for member states uh, as the Islamic State's uh, terrorists uh, return and relocate. So please. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. And thank you, uh, Professor Orvat, did I get that right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, for the kind introduction. Um, I'm just gonna briefly elaborate on your introduction um, for those of you who have no idea who, uh, who I am and who I work for. Uh, so the Counterterrorism Committee Executive Directorate of the United Nations Security Council was established in order to assist the Counterterrorism Committee in its efforts to monitor the implementation by member states of the uh, council resolutions within its mandate, uh, to provide guidance for member states in their efforts to do so, and to facilitate technical assistance. Um, our political analysis and research unit uh, was established in order to strengthen our engagement with our external partners, including international and regional organizations, uh, private sector and civil society, including academia, in order to identify new and emerging counter-terrorism related trends and developments, challenges for member states, and good practices. 
Um, and this is the Global Counterterrorism Research Network we've established, um, which consists of over 80 leading uh, think tanks, research institutes, and academic institutes in every region of the world. Um, one of the recent products of our very successful collaboration is the launch of the CTED Trends Reports. Uh, these trends reports are aimed at bringing to the attention of policymakers the perspectives of academia on counter-terrorism related uh, issues of concern to the council and member states. Um, since we don't really have capacity in-house to do the kind of research which is already out there, and since there would be no point in duplicating it, uh, what we do for these trends reports is to gather, collect, and analyzing the best research on these issues and bring it to the attention of the council. Our first trends report focused on the protection of critical infrastructure from terrorist attacks. Um, and shortly after we submitted it to the committee, it led to the adoption by the Security Council of its resolution 2341, focusing on the same issue. Uh, and now to the uh, second trends report. Uh, it focuses on new challenges for member states as ISIL foreign terrorist fighters return and relocate. Uh, it should be publicly available quite soon. Um, as a few speakers have noted over the last couple of days, ISIL has lost significant amounts of territory in Iraq and Syria, and with it the financing opportunities that those territories provided. At the same time, the rates at which foreign terrorist fighters have been returning to their states of origin or residence, or relocating to third states, has accelerated. Uh, some of the facts and figures in this area vary slightly, uh, but it has been estimated that the, in the European Union, the rates at which foreign terrorist fighters have been returning has reached um, about 30 to 40 percent, and that about 50 percent for at least two member states, um, and that the rates have reached about 10 percent in the Maghreb states. Um, based on the leading research on this topic, uh, this development is clearly presenting member states with unique, new, and complex challenges. Uh, just to briefly summarize five of those challenges, First, foreign terrorist fighters have been relocating to new regions and playing a role in the global expansion of ISIL's networks. It has been estimated that ISIL now has a presence in at least 16 and, as, and perhaps as many as 20 member states in several different sub-regions of the world. Uh, this development is currently being played out in Southeast Asia. Uh, for instance, during the recent attack in Marawi, Philippines, it was estimated that 10% of the fighters there were foreign including some from the Middle East, and we've seen over the last few months that ISIL has been increasingly calling upon its supporters and sympathizers to travel to Malawi. No. Uh, second, um, a larger proportion of foreign terrorist fighters who have been returning and relocating in 2016 and in 2017 have been in the conflict zones for many years and may therefore have gained greater levels of skills, experience, and commitment compared to those who returned during earlier years. They are also more likely to have reached commanding positions within the organization. Third, ISIL has been increasingly calling upon its network of supporters, including returning and relocating foreign terrorist fighters, to carry out attacks on an international scale against civilian or so-called soft targets using low-tech equipment, including knives, improvised explosive devices, uh, weaponized vehicles, and now increasingly weaponized drones. Uh, this style of attack is obviously very difficult to detect, uh, to prevent and to prepare for, but also nevertheless very effective from the terrorist perspective. Uh, fourth, it has been estimated that the execution rates of terrorist plots have significantly increased as a result of uh, terrorists' evolving modus operandi, including the ways in which they use information and communications technologies. Uh, one growing trend, which was previously underestimated, involves the use of single perpetrators who are guided and instructed by their handlers using encrypted technologies. Um, this presents the advantage of the expertise and know-how of their handlers while retaining the advantages of single perpetrators. Oops. Um, it has been estimated that um, single perpetrator plots are almost twice as likely to go undetected compared to group plots. Um, fifth, ISIL has continued to recruit women and to involve children as fighters, including some foreign women and foreign children. When these women and children return to their states of origin or relocate elsewhere, 
This could present member states with some complex challenges, and in particular legal and policy challenges related to children. Um, finally, I should note that despite ISIL's recent losses, those foreign terrorist fighters who have remained in ISIL's de facto territory have also continued to commit serious crimes, including terrorism, thereby exacerbating the largest humanitarian crisis since the creation of the United Nations. Um, as alarming as some of this, uh, I wrote, may sound, but does sound, uh, significant progress has uh, nonetheless been made at all levels in improving our understanding of these challenges and identifying effective ways in which to address them. Uh, my office has worked very closely with member states and our other external partners in order to provide states with more detailed guidance on several related issues. Um, the Counterterrorism Committee, which was established in 2001, now has over 20 resolutions within its mandate, 18 of which were adopted over the last three years. Um, a lot of this increased activity is arguably based on the fact that a lot has been happening. It's been a very evolving uh, threat. At the same time, it's also because we've, worked so, uh, we've been able to work with member states, external partners, in seeing what gaps there are at the level of the council and what more they need to focus on. Um, I'm not going to go through all of our new resolutions and all of the new requirements because that would be quite boring. Um, but if you are interested in seeing all of it, um, I'm directing you to our website. Um, a few of the themes that we are now focused on are addressing the links between uh, organized crime and the financing of terrorism, uh, preventing terrorists from acquiring small arms and light weapons, integrating the gender dimension into counterterrorism efforts, strengthening aviation security, protecting critical infrastructure from terrorist attacks, strengthening international judicial and law enforcement cooperation, and countering terrorist narratives. Um, a few months ago, we managed to uh, finalize our updated technical guide to the implementation of Security Council Resolution 1373 and other relevant resolutions, uh, which is intended to provide detailed and practical guidance on implementing all of the requirements of all of the resolutions within the committee's mandate. Um, two areas which we have worked very closely with academia on, um, as well as member states and international and regional organizations, um, is in developing further guidance on managing violent extremism in prisons and prosecution, rehabilitation, and reintegration strategies. Um, we have seen that prisons can play a central role in supporting disengagement, but there have also been a lot of cases in which violent extremism has flourished in prison settings. Prosecution, rehabilitation, and reintegration strategies can provide a long-term, comprehensive, and human rights compliant approach to violent extremism. Um, and, in such, and in general, such programs do reduce the risks presented by returnees. Until fairly recently, however, a dearth of evidence-based research and detailed guidance on each of these issues made it difficult for states to develop effective programs. Um, even a lot of member states which had invested heavily in such programs required time and experience in order to determine what worked and what didn't. Um, so the research that we've done in these areas and all of the other areas is incorporated into the technical guide. I would also mention that the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, or UNODC, has developed um, a handbook um, focusing specifically on management of violent extremist prisoners and prevention of radicalization through violence in prisons. Um, a number of international and regional organizations and academic institutes have also developed their own um, guidance and good practices in these areas. Moving forward, uh, one area in which CTED is now working uh, more closely with our external partners is in countering terrorist narratives. As a few people have noted already, um, even if ISIL is ultimately vanquished in Iraq and Syria, its message, its vision, and its call to action may continue to resonate with a number of individuals far into the future. Uh, we are therefore working with all of our partners in order to develop uh, not only an effective response to those narratives, but also to strengthen society's immunity to those messages and effectively disseminate our own messages. Thank you for your kind attention, and I look forward to any questions and comments. Thank you.
change the slide. Okay, so uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Daniel Moro. Dr. Moro is the executive uh, director of the US-Italy Global Affairs Forum in Washington, DC. Previously, he was a visiting scholar at John Hopkins University, where he worked on issues related to the Arab Spring, with particular mm -hmm. emphasis on Algeria, Libya, and Tunisia. For uh, 18 years, he was a war correspondent for the Italian Channel 5 TV news, where he also covered world conflict in the Middle East, North Korea, and Eastern Europe. For his uh, valuable work, he uh, was awarded numerous awards. Let me just mention two of them. He is well decorated. So one of them is the Premio St. Vincent Prize, which is the Italian equivalent of the, of the Pulitzer Prize, and also the European Award for TV news uh, in Vienna. His presentation will provide uh, some, some interesting answers on the question, uh, simple but complex question, why has Italy uh, not been affected yet by major terrorist attack? Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, ICT. Thank you, Yona, for helping me to put together a map of the Mediterranean. And the big question that is interesting, especially the Italian press, is why up to now, up to today, Italy has not been affected by major terrorist attack. And this is quite interesting, because there are positive, but also very negative reasons why Italy has been spared up to now by major attacks. The first one is Italy by itself is not a big target, but the Vatican and the Pope is one of the most sensible target in the world. So the Italian authorities in Rome have to deal at least once per week with 30, 40,000 foreigners going to see and to listen to the Pope. So they have a lot of experience in dealing with this kind of uh, difficult environment. Second, we have uh, also, at the small level of the uh, Jewish communities, a very interesting example in Rome and Milan of strong cooperation between the security of the Jewish community and the uh, police of Italy. Just to give you an example, I will leave you my email, so uh, you will ask me if you have any curiosity, and so we will stay in contact. For instance, if you have a private party, and you are part of the Jewish community in Milan, you are kindly requested to let the uh, security of the Jewish community know that in one week you will have at the Hilton Hotel a party. The Jewish community security will let the police of Italy in Milan live practically in, in uh, real time know that something will go on inside the Hilton Hotel in Milan. No uniform police will stay there, but the Italian police will be there to protect you. And this, in Rome especially, uh, the Jewish district is considered one of the safest part of Italy because we started to get pedestrian uh, security well before the Islamic threat because we had killings in the 70s in front of the synagogue because of the some Palestinian terrorists. And so we had to experience this problem much before, earlier than with the Islamic threat. Also, the Italian police has been trained as the British or the Spanish because of their air brigades. So many people, especially in the leadership of the intelligence service, come with a strong experience in intelligence in Italy, inside the country and outside the country. And this makes, in my opinion, a strong difference. Also, about 15, 20 years ago, the Ministry of Interior uh, decided to have a coordination among different bodies. 
So the chief of the police, the carabinieri, the military police, the intelligence service, and so have to meet and share information. I am following this guy, I am following the other. This is not the case of other European countries, as you know very well. Then we have the uh, village structure of the military carabinieri that if you have been to Italy, you probably have seen. In every village of Italy, so 8,000, we have a carabinieri uh, station. The chief of the carabinieri is a kind of, uh, uh, is a very interesting figure because he knows everything about everyone. He will ask the local bank director if he needs to know something about your financial situation, the priest, and so. We adore in Italy gossip, so it will be very easy for him to know who you are. And uh, I saw uh, in person carabinieri working at the local level in Italy. They are shockingly efficient in gathering information. They know a lot about everyone. And in fact, you have the carabinieri when they are deployed. The uh, Ambassador Terzi was the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Italy. And when we deploy carabinieri, say, in Kosovo, they are considered the best uh, peacekeepers because they go in a society which is very complex, like the Italian society. So they, they must be able to handle a lot of different politics, violence in the family, whatever. This is helping Italy to keep the situation in some way in a balance. Then we have the Catholic Church working on the field with volunteers. That's also very interesting because we have about 25,000, 30,000 parishes, means every village in theory three. And they help whatever religion, country you come, they will help you. When we have Ramadan, in many uh, areas of Italy, the local priest will let them meet in a room, in a refectorium, whatever. So the approach of the Catholic Church is very open. And we have, for instance, what remains of the welfare state in Italy is basically free for any clandestine, anyone coming inside Italy. And this also helps, because psychologically, you don't feel yourself in a faraway country from mainly North Africa. If we can put the map uh, of the Mediterranean, I don't know how to do, and Jonah knows. <laughs> and uh, we will see that, for instance, Lampedusa is just 70 miles from, e 70 miles is nothing, so we eat the same food, we have the same psychology in the south of Italy than many people from the north of Africa. So it's not so shocking for them to come. Then we, we may say also that uh, the uh, prosecutors uh, started to work very early with this problem of Islamic threat. I just give you an example if you want to, to study this. I will put you in contact with some people in Italy working on this. For instance, uh, about 15, 20 years ago, you know the uh, motto delivery of documents that in Milan being a business city, we needed to have someone going around very fast. The first guys using this, uh, this motor car were Muslim. A friend, a prosecutor, which is now a member of the Italian parliament in Milan, understood that it was something wrong to let Muslim know too well the business community, the buildings, the porters, whatever in Milan. So they shift to the Latinos from Peru, which are now in charge of this. This maybe is very, you know, could be secondary, but it's not so, so bad. For instance, we started much earlier than the British to use the army helping the police. Why? Because we don't have enough policemen, so we put two young soldiers with one trained policeman, say, in a railway station. Then we have the security, private police of the railway company. So uh, you don't need to have too many trained 
policemen, especially if you don't have enough, and we don't have enough, because we are tourists also. And one of the reasons uh, Italy uh, is in this situation, we have a, a boom of tourists moving from France and other countries this summer, because it is considered a safe country. But of course, we have thousands of targets around, and we don't have enough people to, to control everything. So we use uh, whatever we find. Uh, private police, sold, young soldiers, everything that we can do. The, uh, also, the uh, negative side, which is the south of Italy is in part or totally in control of uh, high criminality. High criminality, mafia, say for instance in Palermo, in uh, uh, Gioia Tauro Airport, will not let Islamic people go around freely. They control the territory. Maybe they control the territory sometimes better than the state. This for an Italian is not nice, but you see, you have the same situation probably in other parts of the world, in Marseille or other parts. Anyway, it's true, and also, we have a situation where someone in the South is getting a lot, doing a lot of money from the traffic. We have a lot of uh, people coming from Black Africa working in the agriculture for two, three euros per hour. So there, is, there are many interests. Some of the ONG, some, are under scrutiny from the Catania prosecutor. Why? Because to keep uh, the Mediterranean clean without any refugee uh, helps uh, the normal sheep movement to go up and down, east and west, without being compelled by the law to stop the cargo ship to help the refugees. So, for instance, one of these companies based in Malta, based in Malta, which is, <laughs> you can see, very easily between, practically between Libya, Tunisia, and Sicily, is delivering all the refugees to Italy and not to Malta. And they went, it was founded in 2013, and in one year, they uh, decuplicate the budget. They got so much money from all around the world. And the founder is a, a ship insurance man. It tells you that probably this guy understood that was useful for the shipping industry to solve the problem, keeping clean this area, taking care with probably some other people money of the refugees. Now, in the past few days, you see that the movement, because Italy has closed practically the Libyan uh, Sicily way, they go up from um, Ceuta and Melilla, from Morocco and Spain, and then they started again through Cyprus and Greece. <laughs> it tells you that you cannot control everything, but last point. One of the reasons they say in Italy is still not so, uh, uh, say, uh, difficult, this situation is because of the immigration of Muslims in Italy is still quite young. So the second generation is about 16, 18 years old. And many friends working in the Italian intelligence tell us that they have to wait another five years to see if they can integrate in the society or not. A positive fact is that Italy has ghettos, but has not Muslim ghettos. So you don't have a banlieue like in Paris, around Rome or Milano, with Muslim-only population. And this also helps. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Moro, for the uh, lessons, very interesting lesson from Italy, which uh, I assume we can agree that are not easily to be adapted in other countries. <laughs> uh, 
but we will have a Q&A session and we will talk about the broader picture as well. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Demir Morat Syker. Am I get it right or? Syrek. Syrek, sorry for that. Dr. Syrek is a, is a senior policy advisor at the European Foundation Democracy in Belgium. His work focuses on the prevention of uh, radicalization. Dr. Syrek began uh, his career as uh, the Brussels representative of the ARI movement a leading Turkish NGO working on the Turkey-EU relations and democratization. During the Cyprus peace process, he took an active role in establishing contact within EU institutions and European think tank on behalf of the Turkish Cyprus community. Dr. Sarek holds a PhD in political science uh, and an MA in European studies, both from the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium and uh, BA in International Relations uh, and Middle East from uh, the Middle East Technical University in, in Turkey. His presentation will, uh, will focus on, on a very timely topic, uh, which is the integration of, uh, of refugees in Europe. So please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. So, uh, Yes, the integration of refugees is indeed one of the most challenging, I think, issues now Europe is facing. And because in the last few years, especially in 2015, indeed, the unprecedented number of refugees arrived in Europe, uh, mostly from Syria, but not only. So their successful integration is now the main issue, and uh, many governments are indeed trying to deal with this issue because this will have consequences in terms of political, social, cultural, but also security consequences if their integration fails indeed. And I must underline one thing that Syrian refugees are not necessarily ultra-religious or radical. Indeed, on the contrary, probably they are even uh, more moderate uh, than some of the Muslim communities in Europe because they come from a relatively secular country, Syria. <coughs> Uh, having said that, they are very vulnerable, vulnerable and they are under the attack of uh, those radical organizations. And indeed, this is not really an uh, unprecedented case because uh, radical organizations, Islamist organizations, have been targeting indeed uh, many fragile communities uh, in the past, in the post conflict situations in the Middle East, in Balkans, in Caucasus. And indeed, uh, in, in Balkans, for example, uh, as you know, the Muslim communities there, they're, they're, they used to be like a very, very moderate, open-minded, and to a large extent secular as well, with the Sufi tradition. <coughs> so if those radical organizations could manage to, could manage to change the, the fabric of those societies in the, in the Balkans, and could create such a threat, I think uh, we have all the reasons to, to be worried about Syrians in Europe. It would be much more easier if you don't really take necessary measures for radical groups to, to at least uh, uh, recruit some of, those, uh, some of those people. And indeed, Syrian refugees are in a quite a unique position in Europe because they are under attack from two different sides in terms of radical groups. On the one hand, the Islamist ones. On the other hand, the far right. And it makes them even more vulnerable and it is also a quite interesting case to see how indeed different uh, radical groups, they share sometimes similar perspectives and use and abuse certain issues from different angles. And it comes from obviously the ideology that they are using because they are both using uh, radical ideologies from different perspectives. So for those Islamist groups, Syrian refugees is a potential uh, to increase their power in Europe. And it is a potential for far-right political parties, too, to abuse the fears in society so that they can increase also their political power. And indeed, as the European Foundation for Democracy, we have conducted a research on the integration policies of uh, different European countries who are hosting uh, Syrian refugees. I will not go into details of the, of the research because we will be publishing the report in the, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but I will mainly talk about the preliminary findings based on the qualitative interviews we had. Uh, we had 245 interviews and 131 of them were indeed Syrian refugees. 
and we also interviewed NGOs, government officials, and first-line practitioners. So we need to understand that governments are indeed in big trouble here. They try to really manage a very complex situation, and in most of the cases, they try to do the right thing, but there are many issues, and I guess if we don't address them now, it will be, it will be too late. So I will try to go through some of those issues, the most challenging ones probably. So many refugees indeed we interviewed, uh, they believe that governments have delegated uh, most of the responsibility in providing services to refugees to NGOs, and it is not necessarily a bad thing. On the other hand, among those NGOs, there are also many Islamist, Salafist, radical groups as well. And unfortunately, they are even supported by governments and even EU funds because they are working with refugees. Uh, and they are not only providing basic services, but they're also providing education uh, and, and even integration courses for refugees. So it is obvious that those groups, they don't really share and promote the values we would like to promote. So it is indeed very dangerous that our governments have been supporting those groups. And it shows very well that we need better vetting processes about those groups, like which NGOs or which individuals can really work with, uh, with refugees. And we need to be more careful in that sense. Another issue, again, these groups are also acting like sometimes uh, self-appointed representatives of refugees. So as they are better organized, they, they go to government uh, authorities, they, they claim that they represent refugees, they raise their issues sometimes in a right way, but on the other hand, they are not representing them and they have no representation function. Of course, it's easier for governments to listen to those people because they are much more organized, they are much more professional, on the other hand, I think that the best way would be still engaging with, uh, with the Syrian refugees directly rather than using those groups. Another issue is the recruitment of uh, refugees by such organizations uh, because obviously they, they also see them as a good potential for human resources and especially the young ones, so they are mainly targeting the young refugees. Also, many refugees indeed uh, raise concerns about the uh, uh, prevalence of ultra-conservative organizations uh, providing education services in kindergartens and also special schools for children uh, that teach Arabic and Quran. So this is probably one of the most tricky issues and obviously what sort of education they're providing is very important. And what we understand, there is no effective mechanisms also to monitor this process. And this is not a unique case. I mean, Islamist organizations have always been using education to indoctrinate people. Uh, many groups from, for example, Gulf countries have been very active in the Western Balkans in the past uh, 15, 20 years to do the same thing. Uh, another example of Islamist organization, for example, the Yulan movement and Islamists and other Islamist organizations have been using education as main tool to indoctrinate. So it is not a unique case, but at least now we know that those organizations use education. We need to be careful and we need to monitor this process better. And another issue is about the NGO funding and projects. Also Syrian refugees uh, are usually complaining that their access to government funds are much more restricted. So if they want to organize civil society activities, trainings, projects, gatherings, their chance of, for having a fund or government support or e-support is much smaller. But usually those bigger Islamist groups, they are getting the support and they are organizing those activities on their behalf. So again, we need to find ways to engage with them with grassroots refugee organizations even if they are smaller, maybe le less professional as well, but we need to be engaged with them directly. Another interesting thing is also that many Syrians also find mosques in Europe ultra-conservative, and they have concerns about going to these mosques, but also they have concerns about their children going to these mosques. And all alone, I think, this is a very important indicator because a group of people who came from a Muslim country to Europe, and they are complaining about mosques in Europe being too conservative. So clearly there is a problem there we need to address, 
And indeed, uh, some refugees uh, in Germany, they even, even though they don't speak Turkish, they go to Turkish mosques because they believe that at least uh, there is no radical mar narrative and at least their kids wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be exposed to a uh, radical narrative in their own languages. And the issue is also about integration courses. So almost all countries, they have integration courses for refugees. But usually those courses focus on very practical matters, language and like main institutions of the country and how things work. But usually very little or not at all on the values. And some countries, they ask refugees to sign uh, a declaration saying that the refugee would be uh, respecting the values of the country, but this is all very vague. And there is no real course explaining what those values are, what are the background of those values, and even why those values are indeed good for those refugees too. Because not only Islamist organizations, but also far-right organizations are attacking the same values. So we are in the same shape. If, you, if, if they want to be in a free society, if they want to live in this way, and they chose Europe rather than other destinations, so that means they, uh, they want to live in a free, open society, so then they need to care about those values and they need to protect those values too. And uh, another issue is about the job market. It was one of the issues indeed, I was thinking that that would be common sense that if they're like high skilled refugees, then a European governments would be using them. And it's good for economy, it's good for their uh, direct involvement in, in the system and all. But only in very few countries such programs uh, exist indeed. So mostly if you're a refugee with a background in engineering, medical doctor, etc., you go and uh, work as a taxi driver. And of course, that is an extra factor that would frustrate you. And though it's not an issue all alone to radicalize someone, obviously uh, radical organizations would be using that frustration. And more than anything, also it's good for economy because for any country to, to raise indeed a new medical doctor or engineer, they spend hundreds of thousands of euros, but they are ready once and maybe for like six months trainings or one year trainings would be, uh, would be enough indeed to, to have them in the job market and also for their integration. And the last point uh, is about the far-right organizations, because polarization in Europe is indeed increasing the, the fragile status of those vulnerable status of those, those refugees. So far-right organizations are using the issue very effectively. Uh, most, mostly they are using the issue at political level and verbally they are attacking refugees, but there are also cases that they are attacking physically. And obviously the other side of the issue, Islamist organizations, are using this very well too, because they say that to the refugees that you see uh, they don't want you, Europeans, they, they don't want you, they don't want you to in integrate, they don't want your religion, they don't want your culture, so don't integrate, come and join us, uh, we need to protect our culture, our religion. So they are using it very effectively, and there we need to be very careful. But on the other hand, it is a very complex issue that those organizations are also attacking their freedom because those people came to Europe to live in a free society. On the other hand, we have heard many complaints, especially from women refugees, that uh, some radical groups, they are putting a lot of pressure on them and they are trying to dictate certain lifestyles. Like to some women refugees, they, they say that you, if you are Muslim, you need, to, you need to wear hijab. You shouldn't act like a European woman, whatever it means. And they put similar pressure on also LGBT communities. Uh, but even, uh, even uh, refugees, for example, who consume alcohol. So in, in some neighborhoods, uh, there are even like physical clashes between, between them because they're forcing them that if they're Muslims, they should avoid such, such things. And I think it's also our responsibility uh, because those people, they escape a country come to Europe, they chose to come to Europe, they didn't want to go to Asia, Middle East, Africa, they come to Europe by believing that there's a free society, it's, a, it's the best place to be. And if you cannot protect them in the middle of Europe, and I, I think we are then betraying them. So we need, to, we need to be there, we need to make sure that those people are not forced by others to act in a certain way. 
Uh, there are obviously many other issues connected to this. I just try to, to summarize the, the main ones. Uh, but I want to underline that they are not radicals, but they are victims. But there is a big potential, unfortunately. And radical organizations, they see this potential. There is still, I think, a way to avoid this. But avoiding this would be by engaging with them. Because the problem is now so many people are talking about refugees or talking on behalf of refugees. But refugees, they don't really have occasions to represent themselves or talk about themselves, their issues. So we need to engage with them. We need to empower them, increase their resilience, but also support their grassroots projects, which are really supporting uh, their successful integration. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, surely one of the topics that will be discussed, uh, can you hear me? That will be discussed later. No? OK, good. So our next uh, distinguished uh, speaker is Ambassador Giulio Terzi. Uh, Ambassador Terzi has a law degree from the University of Milan. He joined Italy's foreign, foreign service in 1973 and uh, his very impressive diplomatic career since includes appointment almost everywhere in Paris, Ottawa, Vancouver, NATO, both in Brussels and in the United Nations, and, and New York. Perhaps uh, not less important is that from 2002 to 2004, he was the ambassador of Italy to the state of Israel. Um, and later, he served as Italy's permanent representative to the United Nations. He then served also as Italy ambassador to the United States from 2009 to 2011, and soon after, uh, from 2011 to 2013, he uh, served as Italy minister of uh, foreign affairs. Currently, is um, active, very active in political and academic life and debates on foreign policy, European integration and European affairs, international security and human rights as well as uh, serving as the president of the Global Committee for, for the Rule of Law. So Ambassador Terzi, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and uh, I am very impressed by the fact that this presentation gives an hint of how, how old I am. So not, not for the importance of things they did, but for the time that they spent probably with, much with no much results on, <laughs> on a long career. But I'm very proud of being here with you and to talk about a subject that, uh, that is global interrelations between global migration, terrorism, and, and integration. And, and in fact, I remember very, very, very vividly last year that uh, we uh, agreed, it was an important panel like today, and, uh, and the, the common uh, understanding, the common feeling was among all participants and uh, also the position that I took myself is that the, this question, this relationship between uh, migration, radicalization, terrorism, and integration is a, a really a, a core political issue for all Europeans, probably for all over the world. But in Europe especially, this is a, a core element of the political debate. And is only going in one direction, not in, in another one. The direction where it's going is the direction of an increased relevance and difficulty in tackling with this question. I cannot but I cannot agree more than uh, what it was said by Dr. Seirak and the other uh, panelists, but especially Dr. Seirak gave a balanced view and complete uh, view and uh, uh, expressing the positions of the right and the left, uh, the mu humanitarian questions, the concern for the rule of law, the protection of human rights, and the fact that very, very important element that you mentioned, Dr. was. Uh, the, the need that the political refugees that we accepted, as we know, are, as President Macron said, time and again, even during uh, complicated discussion with Italian leaders, 
that only a very marginal minority, five, perhaps 10% of all illegal immigrants which are coming on the shore or on the shore of the Mediterranean or for other or through the Balkan routes, only a very small minority uh, is entitled according to the existing convention and international law and also by common sense to get the status of the political refugee. But, but there is no doubt that also those who have entered Europe illegally uh, need to be protected from actions by extremists. Uh, because uh, even if we, in a way, we have been uh, distracted as Europeans in showing that the rule of law and the laws, the defense of common borders for Europe is a serious matter and that every European partner must be committed to defend the external and to protect the laws of the Union and each individual state on immigration issues and to find a way to protect it. Uh, there is no doubt that once uh, those common borders, external borders, have been overstepped, we take the responsibility of assuring that all people who are on our territory, although we can be considered illegal immigrants, must be respected in their dignity, freedom, human rights, freedom of religion, and, and all the fundamental human rights which exist and we have ratified and undersigned, which are universal, not relativistic or regional human rights. They are universal human rights, and this is the basis of our, of our action and our policies. But still, this is a very politically charged debate. And uh, I'll just quote a few lines which have, uh, uh, which have caught my attention in a uh, reading uh, in August, perhaps somebody has uh, more time than other months to read. And, and they went through a, a book, which is an important one, uh, written by Edward Luce, a very well-known journalist, commentator. Uh, in the beginning of his career was a, a speechwriter for Bill Clinton. And then he, he never stopped publishing books and important contribution. And the book is The Retreat of Western Liberalism. And it comes back also to the observation that he made on the question of uh, rule of law and human rights and fundamental freedom. The concept which are universal, but they are, are, they are the, uh, the reason of being proud of the Western civilization. He writes, Luce, Europe may have to turn into a fortress in order to face itself even before Chancellor Merkel allowed up to a million of Syrian refugees in the country, global migration had hit a post-war peak. 3% of the world's population now live in countries other than where they were born. According to Gallup surveys of global migration, 16% of the world, that is to say 700 million people, would move to welter nations if they could. 700 million people. This is especially true of Africa and the Middle East. Many more will keep trying. Many more people will keep trying. And Europe is the, their natural destination. And uh, so, Luce concludes, Viktor Orban was probably right about one thing. Europe should have secured its external border before it scrapped the internal ones. Europe cannot solve the Middle East by importing it. Europe cannot import the Middle East to resolve this problem, nor does it have the capacity to absorb millions of African economic migrants. That is a basic consideration that, 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 has, to, that has to be deeply considered, I, I believe, when, when we face this debate. Because because now we are, we are in a moment when concerns about migration and terrorism appear increasingly interlinked. Again, to come to Gallup uh, poll uh, last year, 66% of Europeans believe that non-resident terrorism is a serious problem. 
and 55% answer to the poll that current immigration levels are a serious problem for their countries. Uh, and in fact, the fear that migration is a sort of a Trojan horse for terrorists seeking entry into the European Union, adding up to jihadist network established by older generation immigrants, continues to spread wider in the European public opinion and among a number of political leaders. There is the fear that the, the threat of Islamic terrorism appears therefore to be linked to public support to anti-immigration policies. It connects immediately to anti, it degenerates and fuels anti-immigration policies. And that is demonstrated again by opinion polls. Among 14 countries studied by Gallup, the relationship between concern about immigration and Islamic terrorism is statistically independent of individual feelings about racial and ethnic minorities. This is a very important data. It is not only in that poll, but uh, it emerges from a number of studies. Uh, the fear about the fact that an, an unchecked and uncontrolled, uncontrollable flow of illegal immigration, a big movement of masses to countries which have not perhaps even the social cohesion, but surely not the economic resources, public resources, to accept in a dignified way and to insert and integrate in a dignified way this huge flow of people very often very poor, uh, unqualified, and therefore difficult to, to be inserted in a labor market uh, of uh, an advanced uh, society, like the European uh, societies are, uh, is this connected, this, this fear that there may be uh, a, a strong backlash in, uh, at, the, at the social and economic level, or that there may be an increased level of terrorism, that fear uh, seems to be a different thing from uh, the uh, um, preconception that people have about uh, race, about religion, about the approach of the diverso, of the others. And that is important because uh, it, it brings somehow this, this problem to, to a separate dimension, which is a more uh, security dimension than the one which is, which is perhaps in the stereotype that the majority of people are concerned by immigration because they are racist. In fact, that, that is not completely true. I don't know whether the um, persons who have spoken before me has, have perceived in the studies and reports and analysis uh, that are around, but there is a difference between the two things, between, between uh, the majority of people who, who are preoccupied about what is going on and uh, uh, people who, who are, uh, who, who are inherently or in their, uh, uh, they, they feel uh, an extremist feeling against, uh, against other races or religions or, or beliefs. Then uh, there is no doubt that uh, what is happening in Libya, and it was mentioned by Dr. Moro, and, uh, and also it is, it is very, very, it has been in the news uh, over, over the last uh, few weeks, uh, the attempt to, to mitigate at least, or to, to re they really have a, a better control on what is, is happening on the southern border of the Mediterranean. Because there, there is a breeding ground, there has been a breeding ground for human traffickers and for jihadist organizations, for Daesh, for every kind of criminal network. And, uh, and also on this question, uh, is, uh, is not very honest, in my humble opinion, uh, to pretend that uh, immigration trafficking, that is to say the human trafficking, because with what has emerged in Libya, the more we, we have been knowing the situation in that territory, especially over the last few weeks, when the whole European Union, but especially the, the Italian authorities, uh, Minister Miniti, our Minister of Interiors, uh, all, all, the, 
all the presence of, of Italian organization and the cooperation also of Libyan authorities of the two sides from Benghazi and Tripoli, it has shown the disaster, the humanitarian disaster which is going on in terms of abuses of criminal uh, exploitation of these flows of poor, uh, poorly economic migrants uh, which are in territory in, in, in a no uh, in, in, in a land where there is no uh, uh, state control and no possible uh, no possibility of checking um, this, uh, this criminality, this very extended criminality. So uh, the fact that uh, the, the tragedy develops in Libya in such in such an, an incredible 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 terms shows that. Uh, it is true what uh, uh, it is true also for Libya, for Niger, Chad, uh, for the countries where there's no real uh, control on this phenomenon. It is true what the United Nations have been writing in a number of reports for years, as far as uh, Central America, Asia, Asian countries, uh, uh, the Gulf of Guinea, and Africa in general, uh, has demonstrated. That is to say that uh, human trafficking, drug trafficking, weapon smuggling, and terror are very closely interlinked phenomena. They uh, are dealt with by uh, organizations which are probably not masterminded by the same uh, 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 line of command by the same people, but they interact and cooperate on various theater. And therefore, it's difficult to, to pretend that there is no, no connection, because uh, till a couple of years ago, perhaps, but even more recently, it was easy to listen a uh, public statement by a very prominent representative of European government, and I include also the Italian government, that immigration, uh, trafficking, and smuggling had nothing to do with, uh, with terror or, or other form of dangerously um, uh, threatening criminality for, uh, for European countries. I, I think that what has been happening in Libya over the last uh, uh, few weeks, perhaps a couple of months, has shown that the situation is much more complex and there is a an evident interaction between the different, uh, these different phenomena. So it is, uh, there is also therefore a, a point which has to be considered seriously, I believe. The, pr the problem which was uh, uh, defined the pull factor of the, of the immigration, for the immigration flows. After the agreement uh, reached between Brussels and Ankara that closed the, the Balkan route, the Central Mediterranean as quickly became the true gate for uh, the European immigration until last month of August. Then everything changed because of the action undertaken by the Italian government, supported recently by the, the European Union with a meeting in uh, Paris among the four uh, European leaders and some African leaders, and therefore uh, the month of August figures uh, went down very significantly from uh, 70,000 of uh, the first seven for, for the first eight months last year. They went down in the month of August this year to 4,000, 4,500. So there has been a very strong, a sudden decrease of this uh, of the agreements which were reached. Uh, bilaterally between Italy and the African countries on the front line, but uh, also of this clear engagement, the political commitment of the European Union and the four major countries in the European Union to support really Italy in uh, protecting the borders, the common borders of the European Union. But there has been unavoidably, uh, we, we, cannot, we cannot forget that there was a, a, a recognizable pull factor in all the operations which were unchecked <laughs> up to a certain point, which were uh, carried on also in not complete clarity, operation of a number of NGOs 
uh, which were organizing uh, transborder, transshipment, uh, very close to the, to the coast, to the territorial waters, and sometimes also within the territorial waters of Libya for, uh, for illegal uh, migrants. And uh, on a number of occasions, there were also evidences, and now there are uh, trials uh, which are uh, in place in Italian tribunals concerning, uh, uh, concerning il contacts and cooperation which uh, are seen, uh, have been seen as illegal by Italian judges and also by the, by the Italian government and other governments. So what has been, why there was a pull factor there? Because, because it, was, uh, it was evident uh, that uh, uh, the presence of such a large flotilla, 20, 25 uh, uh, ships, uh, organized by, by very prominent NGOs also, by major NGOs in the world, uh, was giving the, uh, the assurance to uh, the organizers of, uh, of the, uh, uh, the, the trans-Mediterranean uh, migration uh, the assurance that uh, uh, was just enough to start for a few miles uh, the voyage and to, to, to be sure that there would have been a, 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 a immediately an action of bringing to the Italian shores all these people, even if the conditions of the sea or the, 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 the search and rescue needs were not, were not always and often were not, were not always there. But that, that question of the pull factor uh, ex exerted by a large community of, of NGOs, of humanitarian organizations, gave, was, was a, 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 an unfortunate, a very unfortunate element in the overall debate. And in, in, in a fortunate develop, a development also for the NGOs in questions, because for the misbehavior of a couple of them, perhaps of some operators in the sea and not necessarily of these NGOs involved uh, in, 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 this, uh, in these activities, uh, there were some uh, doubts, in fact, for the, for the true reason, in relation to the true reason which were motivating, uh, which are motivating this essential humanitarian, humanitarian action. So, uh, we have to, I believe, we have to, the European, the European government must be very careful when uh, understanding the conditions, uh, putting the guarantees, and engaging all the operators according to code of conducts, which have been now in place and they have been approved by the European government uh, on, uh, on the basis of proposals by the Italian government. Uh, on immigration and national security again, uh, Dr. Moro was, uh, was mentioning the fact that, yes, in Italy we have a particular situation with some advantages in, in relation also to the fact that our communities, uh, the Muslim communities and immigrated communities are not uh, as confined uh, in, uh, in ghettos. They are uh, more integrated, perhaps, uh, at least partially, than others. And uh, therefore, also the structure of Italian security uh, is more apt to respond to the, to the need that, uh, that we are facing now. Although risk, the risk exists, and the, the fact that the risk exists was shown by what has been happening recently, when every time the Italian authorities have discovered, over the last uh, few months, have discovered an increasing number of cases of Islamic terrorists who either radicalized in Italy or immigrated illegally in the country in order to plan attacks in Germany, France, in Belgium, in Spain, and that only multiplied over the last couple of years. That happened with Adam Arun, active member of Al-Qaeda and then Daesh, it happened again with Ben Nas Medi, a convicted jihadist uh, who returned to, in, to Italy concealed among migrants landed in Lampedusa. In, it happened with Abdul Rahman Nauroz, the leader of jihadist network dismantled by the Italian police in northern Italy. And this case of Nauroz raised strong indignation since this terrorist, this terrorist was 
the beneficiary of social allowances given for, to refugees. And it happened again with Anis Amri, one of the terrorists that uh, were involved in the Berlin attack. So I just mentioned these few elements, but there, there are many more which go back uh, in the time and uh, that uh, demonstrate that uh, the jihadist phenomenon is present in Italy, has been present for at least 20, 25 years. And just to, uh, to conclude, I, I think it has, it has to be recognized that, uh, that we have to be careful also uh, when we talk about these issues, migration, terrorism, and integration, to uh, contribute to, a, to an honest narrative. Because uh, it has been uh, easy for, uh, for at least two, three years for European government to, to pretend that there was no problem, that in fact uh, this connection, uh, the, the threat of terrorism and so on, uh, linked to migration, was not simply not there, that uh, we have to look into integration, uh, education and so on, which is very right. But to, uh, th there was a strong, uh, a strong inclination to look in the other direction. And, and I believe that a distorted and complacent narrative is only reinforcing the attempts by radical Islamists to spread their message that our constitutional values are not seriously believed and supported by all layers of our institutions and by the political establishment. So I think that being aware of our values and to promote our values in our countries uh, in the narrative which is uh, exposed on these issues is extremely important also for our security. Thank you. Thank you for uh, Ambassador Terzi and all the distinguished uh, speakers. Our uh, second half of the session uh, includes question and answers. Uh, but uh, before that, we will have a break of uh, 15 minutes. So we will uh, be here again, let's say uh, 3.25, 3 uh, and 3.30. 3.30, uh, it will give us about uh, one hour and 15 minutes for question and answer. So in this rally spirit, come back after the coffee and be ready to challenge and being challenged. Thank you. So just to... Hello? Can you hear me? So just to give you an update, we are just waiting a few more minutes because the ambassador is being interviewed uh, uh, and he's in his way uh, to here. So just one, two more minutes and we are going to start. Thank you. Okay, so please, please uh, be seated and welcome back to the second half of the session. I would say the most uh, difficult one with the questions. I want to bring, uh, bring, uh, bring in two, two questions which I believe cover uh, all the presentations here. Um, so here are the two points and feel free, uh, this is more for our distinguished speakers uh, and feel free to react on whenever you think uh, is, uh, you have something to say. So basically the security risk or the uh, international security risk, terrorism and some other risk involved on migration, we can divide it to two, two categories. The first category is admission, entry into the territory. And the second category uh, is integration. So once the people, the migrants, the others are already in the territory, that's uh, a second issue. So let me focus, just zoom in on the first category of entry, of admission into the country. So how do you do, uh, how can uh, member states, particularly in Europe, um, can prevent uh, or minimize the risk of terrorism when it comes to entry into the territory? And yesterday I made a point which was uh, when we talk about specifically on terrorism, the point is not migration necessarily, but uh, human mobility. We have every year two billion people on the move, two billion people who cross international borders. And those people include the 250 million migrants, international migrants, but they also include uh, tourists and student, uh, and, and exchange student and uh, asylum seekers and unlawful migrants, etc. And from the point of view of the security risk, the visa here is not the point because uh, we have data showing that uh, in a very, uh, in the, actually in the vast majority of cases, the terrorists, particularly in Europe, were not necessarily migrants, but people who came under different categories or under different visa. So this is the first question. How can we deal with the, or minimizing the security risk when it comes to entries? Uh, what we see now in Europe is uh, maybe two, two 
reactions or two responses for that. One is um, an, an attempt to prevent prevention, and the second one is deterrence. So prevention is all those fences and walls, uh, countries build walls, exclusion, coast guard, you name it. Then, uh, in addition to prevention, we have punishment. Punishment mainly, uh, I would say, criminal law sanctions, deportation, for instance. But the idea is that you have punishment and you have uh, prevention, prevent, prevention in order to uh, try to address the risk involved on migration or human mobility uh, more broadly. And here are the two issues that I want to raise on this category of entry. Number one, both of them are very relevant to Europe. Number one, international law, and specifically European law, has not yet decided what are the legitimate criteria for exclusion. We know, and this is the lessons after World War II, that race, religion, ethnicity would be illegitimate criteria. So when Hungary or some other countries can say, we don't want people because uh, we only accept Christians, uh, the traditional answer in international law would be it's illegitimate. We also know that on the other hand, there are some criteria which are more legitimate, skills, education. The question or the challenge here is the use of culture. When or is the criterion of culture can ever be legitimate when country says that we want, the country wants to exclude migrants based on, uh, let's say, the cultural background of the migrant? This is the first point. The second point is responsibility sharing, which is also risk sharing. Now, of the, one of the most crucial questions in Europe is how do you do the risk sharing? Italy got uh, a high percentage of the migrant, uh, Malta, some other countries too. Uh, and one of the biggest challenges now in Europe is how to do the responsibility and risk sharing. The European Court just last week came out with a decision saying very little about those, this question. So uh, this is the first thing if you have uh, any ideas on the criteria or the legitimate criteria for exclusion and how risk sharing can, uh, if ever, be manageable uh, within the European Union. Who wants to go first? That's an open question. <laughs> While thinking, I can go to my second point. The second point, I think, is even more difficult. The second point is, uh, so the, the first cut, or the first, I said the first issue is how to prevent from entry, from uh, admission into the territory. Then once the, the migrants are already in the territory, the challenge is integration, of course. And within the integration, kind of uh, integration is an umbrella category for many things, but within this umbrella category, uh, one subtopic is how to observe, observe how to integrate a uh, high number of people, let's say the one million asylums and refugees came into, came into Germany last, uh, in the last few years. Uh, how do you do integration in a, way, in a way that, like you said, respect both human rights, the human rights of migrants, toleration, and on the other hand, protect the national interest of the state. And one of the crucial points here is uh, uh, Dr. Sarah's point on the values. So when Germany accepted two years ago one million asylum seekers and refugees, the question was, what, what okay, now what, what are we doing? And uh, I think it was between uh, really tragedy, because it's a real tragedy, to comedy. Uh, because the way they treated or they built their integration courses, uh, at the beginning they just translated the German constitution into uh, Arabic and distributed within the camps. And then they say, no, we have to design some integration courses uh, about language, about some other values. And then uh, there was the question of what, what would be legitimate to expect the migrants when it comes to integration. And here your point on values I think is the key. Is it legitimate to ask the migrants to not only know our values, not only know the German, French, Italian values, or constitution, or history, or civics, or culture, but also has to have certain, certain faith, or certain belief, or certain commitment to those values. And here is the trick. My, one of my articles, I call it illiberal liberalism. And why it's illiberal liberalism? Because obviously the, the goal here is legitimate. Liberal states uh, are trying to protect liberal values, and protect liberal institutions, and they want to so-called liberate the illiberal, or what they perceive as illiberal. But while doing it, they are sometimes turning, or there is a risk in turning, into illiberal means of asking the migrants to accept Western values. I'll just give you one example, then I open it. In Baden, this was before the refugee crisis in Germany, 2007, Baden-Württemberg came with a citizenship test. Now there are lots of citizenship tests in Europe and loyalty oaths and integration agreement as mentioned before. And the idea is that you put the other into a test, a test of belonging, a test of citizenship, in order to see whether they, ex your, they accept or have some faith in your values. And Biden came with this idea of citizenship test and uh, this was a more morality test. It, it, the test focused 
on really ideological and moral issues. I ask questions for like, such as, imagine that your son is a homosexual and would like to live with another man. How would you react? Imagine that your daughter or your spouse wants to swim naked. Do you have any problem with that? One question is about Israel. That Israel, do you think that Israel has a right, not as a Jewish state, Israel has a right to exist? But those are more ideological, moral questions. And the purpose was to put the other into a test of values. And my point here, or the second point, is how to manage those integration in a way which protect our liberal values and liberal institution, but without turning into illiberal means, which probably or maybe, arguably, violate the same values that we, that we seek to protect. So I open it again. Yes? Uh, well, maybe I start with the fir first one, the criteria and how do we allow them to come in. And there is, I think, also confusion about the concepts. And that confusion comes from European politicians, European media as well sometimes. Like, what is a refugee? What is an immigrant? What is an irregular migrant? What is an economic immigrant? And nowadays, some, especially political groups, they try to identify all of them in, under the same category. But they're not. I mean, refugees are clearly, they're escaping from war. So their lives are in danger. And then there are some other people. It's also OK, they can try, and they have all the rights to try to come to Europe. But the only reason they come is because they, they want a better life. So we need to make that distinction first. And even after that distinction, there is a discussion about like safe country. In the European Parliament, it was one of the very hot topics, for example, whether Turkey is a safe country or not, which countries are safe countries. So obviously, I mean, for example, specifically for Syrian refugees, if they are out of Syria, if they are in a safe country, which would mean that their lives are not in danger, then I don't see any reason that their refugee status should be accepted because they're already in a safe country. Of course, there can be like deals, like in the case of like Turkey EU deal, that you may still negotiate that, okay, X number of refugees per year would be accepted because it's also part of the burden sharing or a financial aid will be there, etc. But at least legally, I don't see any obligation for those states to accept those refugees. And as to irregular or economic migrants, I think it's all about the uh, national law. I mean, if they don't want to accept those people, they are coming without their visas, without any permissions, without work permit, then it's the member states, nation states' uh, decision to do that. I mean, very initially, I came to Belgium also, like as a Turk. I needed visas, work permits, and all this. And why I dealt with like all these lengthy processes, did it in a legal way, while others are doing it in other ways. Because it's also encouraging other people, uh, and also stressing the ones who are really doing the legal way. So once you do, you you're well educated, you invest a lot of time, energy, and then you go through the legal way, and then some others are just, just coming, and then some people claim that we should just open our borders. And we need to take that discussion from there as well, I think, because it's now black and white, because one part is saying that we shouldn't accept any refugees, and the other side is saying that, oh, we should just open the borders and anyone should come, because none of them are feasible, and none of them are in line with our values, so we need to find a way but I don't think in Europe we have identified that way yet. And I think Syrian crisis shows us that we don't know how to handle uh, with the refugee crisis. And I mean, God forbid, if there is like a bigger crisis, imagine, I don't know, a bigger war in the Middle East or in the Gulf region or Russia or wherever, and imagine not three or four million, but 20 million refugees want to come to Europe. So what do we do then? There is no strategy. And the rules, because most of the time, okay, human rights organizations would also refer to international law that it's our obligation, but then we need to maybe modify some of them and make it more realistic and up-to-date, because how those obligations would force those countries to accept, for example, 20 million refugees, and how they are going to handle that. So we don't know, we don't have those tools, and rather than discussing how to deal with the issue, and when there's a bigger issue, how to deal with that next. I think we are just accusing each other and then coming up with uh, 
totally unlogical options like totally sealing the borders or totally opening the borders that are not feasible. Thank you. Dr. Mora, please. Um, yes, very interesting. And I would like to ask a question to the ambassador. Yesterday, the Italian parliament tried to legislate on the use soli, which is a very interesting new law that part of the parliament would like to introduce. Say, when you are from a Tunisian family, born, you are born in Italy, we will help you to get as soon as possible the Italian passport. My question is, apart from being uh, in favor or against, does the ambassador believe that it is possible, to, because the Italian passport is also a European passport, to have some kind of, uh, say, rules inside the new passport that will allow the European authorities to strip the passport from you if at some point at 30 years old you become a terrorist, like a Nazi uh, becoming uh, uh, spotted in Canada. We have some friends here working, that working on this. So they discovered that you were an Auschwitz guardian. You have the Canadian passport. Still is possible to ex expel you from the country. Don't you think this way could find a kind of compromise inside the Italian public opinion to help the young to integrate, but on the other side to le let the authorities in Italy expel this guy if something goes wrong? Well, the, the issue of uh, stripping uh, somebody of a nationality uh, given uh, or originally uh, uh, taken by the sentence. Uh, it has been one of the major point for President Hollande, as you remember, in uh, the proposed reform which had to be withdrawn because uh, it was not constitutionally feasible. So it is a very, very difficult decision, I think, from the legal point of view and uh, also according to the major convention which has been ratified by European countries, I think, is is almost unfeasible, I, I guess. Uh, but uh, here, here is a question, uh, uh, the, the question of the so-called uh, use soli, it is to say whether a, uh, uh, the, the present legislation, the Italian legislation, already contains elements by which a foreigner for, uh, born by uh, persons uh, of foreign nationality in Italy can decide to become Italian uh, at 18 years of age uh, if he decides so. Now, the, the, the present question to give the EU solid to give automatically the nationality to, to everybody, every, every kid who is born in Italy, like in the United States, for instance, but we have very different, profoundly different stories, uh, even on immigration uh, between Europeans and, and Americans. Uh, poses a, a um, first of all, the dimension of the problem. We are talking about around one million people, uh, young uh, uh, people under 18 years of age, who can immediately benefit, who can immediately have access to the Italian citizenship and the, therefore to the European citizenship. Uh, it is a very important figure. We have, uh, although is a, a, a figure which is not uh, completely uh, verifiable. But uh, our statistics say that in Italian there are, uh, there is 7, 8% of uh, foreign residents. If you consider those who are not accounted for, and please be aware that the Italian government allowed during uh, 2014, 2015, allowed more than 100,000 immigrants, illegal immigrants, to enter Italy uh, without even checking them, without uh, checking, taking the fingerprints or uh, biometric or doing any sort of health check, and that's very risky, as you know, there are 
And uh, uh, if, if we see what happened that, because there was the wrong <laughs> expectation by somebody in the government, that all these people that have emigrated north, but obviously the other were not uh, dumb, and uh, so it had a negative reflection in our relations, on our relations also, uh, with France, Austria, Germany, and for this specific point of immigration. And that was the reason why the so-called solidarity with Italy was so difficult by other countries, because the trick that was organized, and, and I, I think it was a very wrong decision of doing that, having such a rationale. But if you look at these recent precedent, which are motivated by what? Which are motivated by a number of forces which per se are very positive, but somehow act uh, in, in, in stranger directions, like you, you have a strong compassion uh, among uh, the, the, oh, uh, the Catholic Church as, as a big uh, saying in moving uh, individual con consciences, the re religious uh, uh, reasons why we should open our doors without any sort of condition, any kind of fear. So uh, when you look at those precedents, giving the nationality to more probably than one million persons who will become in, in the in the matter of a few years youngsters they will get married we, uh, they will uh, they will have families possibly larger families than than uh, than uh, the, ori the original italians they will attract for reasons of family reconjunction tens of thousands of other people so is a big social impact which is going to be produced, social economic impact which is going to, to be produced on the country. So the big question mark, which is uh, not only a, a, an element of discussion between the right or, or the left, or center right, center left in Italy, but also within the party of, uh, uh, in government, the major party in government, which is uh, Partito Democratico, belonging, led by Mr. Renzi and by the Prime Minister Gentiloni, there is a split on this question of, of EU soli. Uh, no, not everybody agrees. Perhaps uh, ev even a large segment of the party disagrees with, your, with the need to do so now, especially. Now, that w where we have a very large movement, as I mentioned, is not even accounted for. A uh, large number of people residing in Italy. When you go, I, I, uh, I mentioned that uh, I agreed with what you say, Dr. Moro, for uh, our differences, there are no uh, such evident as evident ghettos in my country as perhaps in others. But trust me, if you go to Piazzale Loreto, uh, terribly famous for other reasons, and you drive from Piazzale Loreto to Linate, you will see what I'm talking about. Uh, there are large communities. The, Itali uh, the, the original Italians from there have disappeared. I'm talking about Milan, about the heart of Milan. And uh, most of the people who see around don't even like particularly to, to be seen or to, to live close to... The, to the, so th th there is a difficult uh, of coexistence. That doesn't mean the criteria of exclusion are... I don't like that. Uh, it is evident. It recalls me a, a book, uh, again, sorry if I <laughs> refer to too many books, a Country of Immigrants by John Fitzgerald Kennedy, written in 1958, and was one of the basis of his success, his electoral success in 1960 as President of the United States. Uh, he was categorizing the different, uh, and why it was so important, this book, because said, it, now is the time, up to now, we have preferred Northern Europeans, we have preferred uh, English-speaking people coming to the United States, they were easily uh, integrated. Now is the, kind, the time to open up to the Italians, to the Greeks, to other Europeans. He, he was talking about exactly about integration. And they were profiling nationalities, of course, and uh, there were quotas. Now it would be impossible to, to approach a problem of immigration in those terms. But, but I believe, and it is impossible also, and it would be not compatible with our sensitivities for human rights and human dignity, to approach this problem in terms of prefer Christians vis-a-vis -vis Muslims or Sufi vis-a-vis Wahhabis -vis, uh, and so on. So uh, this is not. But, 
the, the criteria of selection for the integration labor market must be there. And the selection must be exerted, exercised, and implemented before the, the board of the union is crossed. Uh, this is the rule that, uh, that exists and should exist in the European Union, both at the national level and the, and the, and the union level. take a stab at your um, first question. Um, it's true that we haven't worked out a full list of legitimate uh, criteria for exclusion, um, but there are, all, are obligations for exclusion, um, as well as um, exceptions to that. Um, the main obligation to exclusion is that you are not allowed, um, that you must deny safe haven to terrorists and other serious criminals. Um, so it's not just a legitimate criteria, um, it is a very strong obligation to do so. Um, on the other hand, um, um, there is a requirement to prevent uh, refoulement, um, to avoid deporting individuals to states where they are at risk of torture or other ill treatment. Um, so those are the two kind of overwhelming uh, criteria, either for exclusion or for avoiding deportation. Um, looking at the issue of um, withdrawing citizenship, um, it is legal in the case of dual citizens, or so long as you do not render an individual stateless. Um, but it's also problematic in terms of international cooperation. Um, often if you uh, deport someone or um, withdraw their citizenship um, with a view to preventing them from returning to your country, or as a lead up to deportation, you're essentially just sending that problem elsewhere. Um, if you so extradition is, um, is uh, something you can do, but prosecution is an international obligation unless there is a proper extradition treaty and not just deportation. Um, what's happening is that this individual whom you have considered a risk already as a member state, uh, you've already identified them as a risk, um, most likely because there was evidence collected within your country against this person, which you could have used in order to prosecute them. If instead you withdraw their citizenship, to prevent them from returning or deport them, you've simply exported the problem to another country, in many cases countries that have lower capacity to deal with it than you do, and you might still have the evidence within your country, and if you're not sharing that evidence and intelligence, which is typical, you've made it far harder for that country to deal with it. This person may bounce from that country to another country back and forth, essentially presenting a major risk to international peace and security, they might show up pretty close to you again at some point. Um, so it's not that it's not uh, legal to withdraw the citizenship of dual citizens, um, again, so long as they're not rendered stateless, um, but you are simply spreading a problem which you could, may have been able to better deal with um, through regular prosecution mechanisms. Um, the other um, thing that many states do, which is um, instead considered a, a better approach, instead of withdrawing citizenship, um, is to um, cancel travel documents or temporarily can um, cancel travel documents or invalidate them to prevent them from leaving the country, um, which means that you're instead deliberately keeping them at home rather than sending them elsewhere to ensure that instead of um, traveling elsewhere and escaping that you have that person within your custody and can properly uh, gain evidence against them and bring them to justice. I agree with uh, my colleagues and uh, how to prevent the risks. Uh, uh, I want to uh, point uh, something which I found very useful in last year, it is readmission. We it is what? A readmission. readmission uh, it is based on readmission contracts with countries we uh, announce as a safe countries. And we have a very successful example because it is vulnerable we have almost 100 people from Afghanistan in Bulgaria. We have such an agreement. And we give them clothes, some money, uh, medicine, and we um, readmit them to, to the Afghanistan. It is under this agreement, and it works. Also, it is also uh, the um, sign to others who want to cross the borders, because they know that if they come in the country, they will be readmitted. 
it is, uh, I think, a very successful measure. According to the uh, integration, I have a lot of questions about this because uh, we are in a very strange situation. We are trying to start currently, and people who are uh, who can't uh, in uh, in the Bulgaria, they, they, they don't want to stay in the country, and they are not motivated to be integrated. Uh, we have some uh, people, there are not so many, but uh, uh, under the relocation agreement with EU, but they are not motivated, they are not keen to integrate in the society. On the other side, the society have no will to integrate such uh, people, which is all, also the problem. So I, I have a, a question, how you uh, feel and do you have any data or information about the motivation of the refugees to integrate into society? It is, um, I think, the huge problem in the moment because it is not effective till, till now, it is not effective, no, no positive results and it takes a lot of time because they, uh, almost all of them, they don't know the language very well no uh, tools to, to be educated, and uh, it is very great job. Okay, thank you. I want to open it for questions. Just one uh, one comment on uh, Dr. Moore points on removal of citizenship. So I think there are three three issues that uh, that are at stake here. One is law, mor second is morality, and the third is effectiveness. So in law, and I completely agree, there are legal limitations. So of course. You cannot strip someone's citizenship if the person is becoming stateless. There are international laws against that. The second thing is more about effectiveness. I have been puzzled always with the question uh, whether it's really effective uh, citizenship deprivation. Because I would imagine that if you a person is charged of being a terrorist and the alternative is to go to jail for life or just to be stripped citizenship and then to be deported back to Pakistan, I, I'm, I'm not, I kind of raised out what, what alternative is more effective. And the third is more a moral thing. So even if it's lawful and it's very effective, it's just a kind of a rhetoric question. I think most people who support citizenship dep deprivation would only support it when it comes to naturalized citizen, those who are becoming or became already citizen, rather than natural born citizen. Uh, would you support citizenship deprivation in the case of a natural born Italian who is involved in, uh, in terrorism. Okay, so let's open it. Uh, I will collect three uh, at the time, and then uh, we'll give the, our speakers an opportunity to, to answer. So yes, one, two, and three. Okay, first question. I have two. They're both very basic and very simple. Uh, we've heard the term freedom fighter. One man's freedom fighter is another terrorist. The question I ask, how does a world body give a definition and define between those two. The second, Europe is being convulsed by immigrants. There is a country in the Middle East that has land, money, common culture, common religion. So the question I ask is, what is the role of Arabia in accepting these immigrants? Thank you. Uh, second? So in the past hours, we've been discussing the role of global integration and as endogenous pressure over the Western culture, and mainly addressing the issue of integration as transcontinental phenomenon from Middle East, North Africa, mainly toward Europe. But what about intercontinental movement of people, which we know is part of the root causes and negative feedback, which then brings migration from within the border of countries such as Africa toward it's only regarding Europe, right? Because of the intra-European movement, that's your question? No, it's intra-movement, movement within Africa, and uh -huh. sure. to prevent movement toward Europe. Thank Before you. Before it reaches Europe and Western societies. Of course. Please. Sir? Uh, yes? Yeah, yeah, but I, I collect three and then I will give them an, an opportunity and we will collect more. Please. Okay. Yes? My question relates to the comments you made at the beginning of your very thoughtful uh, prevention. Uh, what is being done in a systematic philosophy and policy to promote the, uh, the indoctrination of basic core, simple core values?
Sure. Can you hear the questions, or shall I give the microphone to a person who is asking a question? There is a microphone, another microphone in the room? Just repeat the question. So, uh, the question was uh, uh, about the protections or how to... Uh, um, promote. Sorry? How to promote the basic core value. The basic core value, which are Western value and also liber uh, universal value, if I understand your point correctly. Respect for life, human dignity, uh, respect for the dignity of all of the other, uh, whether they be uh, religious or humanistic in their way of faith. And to what extent there is a serious attempt to inculcate these values in the immigrant population, especially the younger generation, who are captive audiences in the schools. Of course, just to, um, um, in the literature, there is all these yeah. questions. Yes, always this point of uh, when liberal democracy should be less tolerant to into so when do we have an obligation to tolerate the intolerance uh, and especially uh, when when it comes to those. Okay, please. I have a, a couple of uh, things to say. One, in Italy, you remember we have a young generation, second generation of mass being. As far as I remember, the problem is generally inside the Muslim family. Generally between the young women and the father. Because the young woman is integrated in the Italian society. So she is trying to live in a, what the gentleman said, in a universal value system where women are respected where they can inherit, where uh, the kids are <laughs> under their protection and not the husband, for instance. One mayor, I think the mayor of Padua, discovered that when they uh, uh, became Italian, many times, the, uh, especially the North African women, don't speak one word of Italian. So they started to teach the language of our country to the women. Because the women, as we know perfectly, make the difference in microcredit in India as in law abiding in Italy. So I think the cultural work is very important. Of course, the other is quite common in Europe, I don't know how much it is practiced, to ask the imam to give the sermons in Italian and not in Arab. Uh, I think uh, we have to do something little by little on this. What we are missing is European cooperation dealing with this, on who is a refugee, who is a refugee. My grandfather left Italy because he was a socialist and there was Mussolini in power. That was quite clear to me, but many people from Ethiopia, they throw away the documents when they get to Italy, and they pretend to be Eritrea. We know that in Eritrea, the regime is totally is different from the Ethiopian or the Saudi uh, regime. And uh, of course, uh, there is a big difference. And we saw some incident a few days ago in Rome, where refugees thrown gas can from the second floor, floor on the Italian police, and they were refugees. My grandfather was a refugee, never attacked a French policeman in Paris. I mean, we have to be maybe politically incorrect with the, our refugees. A refugee is not uh, supposed to do this when the Italian police is working for his security also to protect him. Thank you. Please. But maybe we didn't mind. Because um, it's been recorded, so we want to sure, make okay. sure that you are heard um, well. Slightly off topic, but can I still take the one on the definition of terrorism? Okay. Um, so uh, the United Nations um, does not have a definition of terrorism per se, uh, but we do define what constitutes a terrorist act in the 19 Universal Counterterrorism Instruments. Um, they're comprehensive, I won't um, list them all right now. Um, but hijacking on board an aircraft, um, attacking a diplomat, or civilian targets, maritime, etc. Um, and uh, this, on the one hand, um, is a practical way of looking at it. It avoids discussing the ideology 
or the political justification um, that the perpetrator used um, to justify their acts entirely. We just move completely away um, from the question of what justifies a terrorist act because absolutely nothing does. Um, I don't agree that one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist. I think anyone who has perpetrated any of those acts as defined in the universal instruments is a terrorist and not a freedom fighter. Um, the other um, benefit to defining terrorist acts instead of, um, instead of terrorism per se or looking at um, ideologies um, is that morally, instead of looking to the terrorists to um, explain their ideology, you're looking at what kind of impacts um, these acts had on the victims. Um, and here I'll make a, a personal confession as well. Um, typically when I see news of a terrorist attack, the, one of the first questions that pops into my head when something so inexplicable and horrible happens is why did he or she do this? In asking that question, I also answer it. The reason they did it is because now suddenly I'm interested in who that person is, what they think, why they do it. I'm looking at their ideology, which I would have never been interested in had they not done this horrible thing. The question that should enter my mind, or the two questions that should enter my mind, are firstly, what impact did this have on the victim? And what do we need to do to help that victim or victims? The second one is, how can we prevent this from ever happening again? So looking at what the acts of terrorism are, and then making sure that we develop um, effective approaches to preventing it is what we should be doing and basically not sitting there, in my opinion, and discussing the ideology and getting into the myth that there is such a thing as a freedom fighter if they have perpetrated an act like this. Thank you. More thoughts? You just Wait. quickly, if, if uh, Hamas fires a rocket at a civilian center or Hezbollah, is that considered a terrorist act? And is the UN willing to challenge them on that? Or is it brushed under the rug? Um, anyone who commits the terrorist acts, any individual or organization, has committed a terrorist act, absolutely regardless of who it was, why they did it. Um, when you say, is the UN willing to deal with it, it is primarily the responsibility of member states to protect their citizens from terrorism. So essentially, we are not going to do anything. If there is a terrorist attack, believe me, it will be your authorities coming in and saving the day. You won't be seeing me. Um, so <laughs> and thank God for that. Um, <laughs> so I don't know what you mean by, is the UN going to do anything? I mean, we're doing what we are doing, but it is definitely your authorities who are going to, in any country, who are going to be doing something proper about it, something practical. Well, welcome to Israel. Uh, so I will collect more thought, or I can collect uh, three more questions. So one, th two, and uh, there was another one here. Yeah, three. One, two, three. Okay, you can hear it by mic. Uh, I can? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, thank you for your Okay, my name is Shmuel Egushalmi and I'm a social activist uh, from Be'er Sheva. I want uh, to ask a question uh, in relation uh, of uh, integration uh, or possibility of integration uh, of uh, uh, immigrants uh, and uh, refugees uh, that come uh, to Europe uh, from uh, Africa from the uh, Middle East uh, uh, because according to my opinion uh, uh, today the uh, most important uh, problem, uh, most important uh, task uh, this uh, to help in integration of uh, refugees uh, uh, that uh, get uh, to Europe uh, uh, because uh, creation of uh, a more uh, social equality uh, can uh, to help uh, in the uh, struggle uh, against uh, terrorism and uh, simply I want uh, to know uh, how exactly uh, European uh, states uh, uh, trying uh, to help uh, in integration 
of uh, refugees and uh, migrants uh, that uh, get uh, to uh, Europe, to United Europe and other uh, places uh, in Europe. Thank you, sir. Please. Um, if you're a citizen of Greek descent, and I'm sorry I don't see your panel, anybody from Hungary or Austria, <laughs> because these are the countries basically that they have closed the borders. So unfortunately at this point, EU is hostage in the hands of Erdogan, who opens and closes the valve of the refugees according to how he wants to deal with the European Union. Um, your country, Bulgaria, of course Italy, and of course Greece have been suffering the brand So my question is, are we going to have European, um, the European Union is going to be of two different speeds, of two different laws, one basically for the integral part of the European uh, countries, the ones that they close the borders, <coughs> and they're going to let the brand of the refugees be taken by the country that they are the external border of the European Union, <coughs> or you are going to have Europe, what Europe meant. And of course, my second one about integration is I have a great deal of questions, and I doubt the whole, uh, very seriously actually, the whole effort of that. And if I can recall that Peter Gergen, who is uh, basically a very astute student of uh, counterterrorism, he pays more attention actually to try to prevent uh, terrorists from integrating, quote unquote, with the refugees, and actually trying basically to prevent terrorists from coming through the refugee program. So, and I hope that the European Union establishes more rigorous, actually, uh, measures in order to stop terrorists from coming, uh, covering under the model of refugees. Thank you, sir. Please. I apologize. Mine are relatively short. Uh, Thank you. Just one question and one comment, please. Thank you. 
the difference of, of social welfare with my point of view. How to handle it, I don't know. It's in the last view. Thank you. Last comment. Yes, please. There is a Oxford English Dictionary definition of genocidal terror. Uh, terror directed against any individual group is a Thank you. Your comment. Answer at all. Yes. We don't hear I mentioned in my presentation that without efforts of Turkey services and border police, we couldn't be manager of the situation. I think that we need to perceive them as a part of the total uh, system of uh, security system of the world. Uh, and they also put a lot of efforts to stop these waves and to manage with the situation. That is true. The results are not which we want to have, but uh, it is true they, they make their efforts and they, uh, because of them, uh, now we have eight times less migrant uh, pressure. Uh, according to uh, the process of relocation, relocation, it is agreement. It is uh, I don't agree with the principles, but we need to take any decision and to help the countries who, we, who are on the external borders. Uh, it is not very successful, you know very well, uh, but we need to think more about this because as you, you are right, the uh, social welfare systems are not equal, uh, the languages are different, and the main uh, uh, goal of, of all these refugees is Germany or Austria or one or other country. All others are not so attractive but uh, we need to share all these problems with our, our partners. Um, according to um, return policy, uh, I think that uh, um, this situ uh, situation now is the right one because uh, we cannot solve the problems, for example, uh, for all Afghanistan people because they are more than us. <laughs> And if they come uh, with their problems in our country, and we have agreement, it is announced as a safe country now, we have all rights to uh, return them. Um, most of all that uh, this return is uh, vulnerable. Uh, voluntary, sorry. Uh, we have very successful experience also with Greece, and it, it works because Everybody who, uh, who crossed our border from Greece, for example, is uh, returning to uh, 24 hour. Uh, and this is very strong signal, a signal to refugees not to try to uh, make a new route to other countries and Balkans. And this helps us to control the situation and to uh, have such a situation as now, which is more better than in previous years. It is a uh, matter of balance, measures, and interest because, uh, just one thing that you mentioned, uh, almost 95 or more percent of people who are crossing the external border of EU are crossing illegally. They don't come legal on a border check, um, on our border, and show their documents, and say, I apply for religious tax. No, it's not. They're trying to cross the border illegally uh, with criminals coming with criminals, and it is not uh, the case which we can uh, accept. Ambassador Terzi. Thank you very much. I appreciate the question concerning uh, the crossing of Mediterranean, the central Mediterranean issue in, uh, in crossing the border of the European Union by this immigration flows. Why over the last three years, three and a half years, uh, 
this flow has incredibly increased towards Italy and not to other routes, and why it was not stopped. Uh, there was no political will from the Italian government to stop it. And uh, that was very evident because of the number of statesmen, propaganda, ideological stances from different poli political forces, not only political, but also religious, was so evident that this continuous campaign pro-immigration, pro-open doors, pro-humanitarian at every cost, was an enormous uh, promotion of uh, human trafficking for the traffickers. Uh, the, 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 not only the rumors, but the consideration, these elements were used like advertising by criminal organizations to go in the villages in Chad, in Niger, in Central Africa, in Nigeria, and so on, and to enroll people who were ready to depart to in other situations, in another climate, who never even imagined to move towards Europe. That, that was political, a clear political mistake, a huge political responsibility, which is sooner or later should be exposed by a number of uh, uh, a number of politicians in my country and in Europe to, to give the absolutely wrong message, a counterproductive message vis-a-vis uh, -vis -vis the traffickers. In fact, when the Partito Democratico and the government lost heavily the administrative election, the, re the, 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 the elections uh, a few months ago because of immigration concerns, uh, the policy changed, the message became different, the Minister of Interior started traveling uh, full-time in the countries of origin of this immigration, providing support and uh, striking deals and so on, and the flux of refugees decreased from 70,000 to a few thousand. So that's, that's the answer. Was, Technically, it's not, it's not a problem. There are, in a full safety of, of emigrants, you can exercise a, a very different control of the maritime border. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Uh, thank you. The uh, first point, I think it's quite clear that uh, we allow too many people to enter the countries as refugees. That's one point. Refugees are people fighting against their own government, persecuted by the Eritrean government. That's very clear. Many of them are inside the Asmara prisons, inside Eritrea. Few of them are able to leave the country. We, we must universal. We must protect them anywhere in the world. Then we have economic migrants. I will add that also the Italian entrepreneurs and so are quite happy to have these kind of people without legitimate reason to stay inside the country, as the American have 11 million undocumented people working in our home. My house keeper in Washington DC probably is undocumented as many other people are. Mm -hmm. And everyone is very happy to have these underpaid and no rights, no trade union, nothing people. So we have to be very realistic. But I think the big problem is at least at the European level to find a common rule to define who is a refugee. Thank you. Last comment? Um, uh, just to very quickly clarify what I meant by a deport. Um, so I'm talking about a withdrawal of citizenship and deportation, not extradition, which is a completely different thing. Um, so if you use proper extradition procedures with another country, um, and you provide mutual legal assistance alongside extradition, any evidence that you have collected, or whatever intelligence it was that led you to identify this person as a risk, making them worth deporting in the first place to that other country. Um, and that country is also um, 
willing to uh, work on a tradition with you, um, and as you say, they may have a better capacity um, to bring this person to justice, um, that's great, that's fine, that's encouraged. Um, it's only um, deportation, withdrawal of citizenship and deportation instead of extradition, um, which presents the risk of impunity um, and exporting the risk to other states. Thank you. Uh, just very briefly, there was also a question whether those radical NGOs indeed are supported by Saudi Arabia. Uh, well, I will give you a background, and you can guess those three countries. Those NGOs are either connected to Salafist groups or NGOs uh, supporting political Islam or NGOs with uh, extreme Shia views. So you can guess three countries. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, I believe that uh, we have reached our time, so I can, cannot unfortunately collect more questions. Um, we, if we have witnessed, we have many open questions and many uh, debates and open debates and controversies and lots of uh, work to do in the future. So please join me in thanking our distinguished guests until the next time. Thank you. Thank you.